from Crema Media in Johannesburg, this is the Real Economy Report. South African defense platforms company Paramount Group announced in September its plans to begin full-scale manufacture of its Arlac fixed-wing aircraft at a 15,000 square meter purpose-built facility at Vonderboom Airport, north of Pretoria. Dylan's data tells us more. The new manufacturing facility is a dual workshop facility, whereby one portion of each Arlac will be made in one half of the factory, while the remainder of the airframe will be completed in the other half of the factory, thereby bringing full line production from the factory to two airframes a month. Paramount Group have also earmarked to land at the airports for the possible expansion of the factory should production need to be ramped up further. Arlac test co-pilot Paul Porthita explains the capabilities of Arlac to potential clients. Arlac is a very unique aircraft. It can carry a, a large array of sensors all over the aircraft. We've got 25 hard points on the airframe. It makes it very easy for us to integrate new systems. We've also got a soft plug and play system where we can plug in those systems. To, the aircraft can easily accept that. So that's very unique in the aircraft industry. That allows us to integrate much faster than the competition. I think we're boosting South African industry. We're flying many South African sensors, proudly South African aircraft. Um, it's a very unique aircraft in, in reconnaissance and intelligence gathering, uh, surveillance, and then it can be armed as well. So it's, it's, it's all rounded aircraft. It's got uh, extended endurance, 10 hours uh, when we're in a loiter pattern. Uh, part of that is you don't want to sit in that seat for 10 hours, but it allows you to fly to a forward airfield where there's no support, no ground crew or anything to help you. You, you still have fuel, you can stretch your legs a bit. The aircraft can fly anything from nap of the earth, very low level reconnaissance flying up to 26,000 feet. Uh, we've got oxygen on board so we can, uh, can, can do that for the entire mission, the endurance. It's fast on the one hand, uh, up to 700 kilometers per hour and 150 km per hour on the slow side. So depending on what the mission requires, if it's a low loiter surveillance mission, we'll do it fast. If it's a fast dash to a point of interest, we can do that as well and sit there for extended periods. With the Arlac manufacturing program set to begin in early 2017, Porchita explains how Paramount Group will be undertaking the project. The second aircraft is currently in production. It's almost finished. And then uh, end of September, we're starting to move into our new factory at Vonneboom Airport, where we start producing low level initial production right next year and then move up production rate up to 36 aircraft a year. In other news, South African Defence Group Danau launched its conceptual Africa truck demonstrator during this year's Africa Aerospace and Defence Expo, which took place at Watercliff Air Force Base in Pretoria during September. BAE Systems Business Development Manager Henny Smith explains the development of the concept. The purpose of this truck, the development of this truck, was firstly to reinforce the industry's capability in the uh, ability to develop and design and develop a truck and still have the capabilities for a military truck. Okay, the military truck, the Africa truck, as you see it here, is obviously its purpose is to carry cargo, to cargo around Africa. And uh, we wanted to design a purpose-built truck that could be modular in terms of the container, as you can see, that in this configuration we have a field office, but you could have a field uh, ambulance, a field hospital, a container truck that does command and control or even a petrol bowser. So the purpose is to have a single configuration truck that can have different back builds and carry different types of cargo. Under, protect, under protection, there was a request to, in, uh, to illustrate the capability to industry again and we only had 10 weeks time. The challenge was to launch the truck at AAD. So this truck was developed and manufactured in 10 weeks time. The truck is based on a current uh, vehicle that we have, the RG31 Mark 6. So in all honesty, yes, we had some of the development done on the RG31 Mark 6, and we took the technology of the RG31 Mark 6 and within 10 weeks converted that into an Africa truck. This truck's intention is not to replace the sawmill or as we know it, the project that is there, Project Vistula, to replace sawmill. This is not the purpose of the truck. The truck does similar things to the uh, sawmill, but it is not the intention of this truck to replace Vistula. As I said and reiterate again, 
The purpose of this truck was to reinforce the capability to renew truck technology as we know the sawmill technology since 1975, 40 years old. So we're renewing the technology but definitely not the intention to be Project Vistula. The aging sawmill range, you must remember, in this specific version that we have here, it is a protected vehicle, mine and ballistic protected vehicle. In the sawmill range of vehicles, the protection was added as an afterthought. Once they started hitting landmines, they developed a protected cab which was put onto the sawmill. If you see the sawmill vehicle called the Quefuel, which is the protected version, you will see it's an armored cab that was bolted onto the uh, truck. The, the, the soft skin cab was taken off and this was bolted on, whereas the Africa truck, it's purpose built. This is not built on a sawmill chassis, we've used the RG31 Mark 6 uh, cab and we've added the back to this. Also the advantage that we have in terms of the container system, the ISO container system, not all sawmills, not all sawmills are configured. Some sawmills are configured to carry containers, but then to roll on, roll off your container system, you have a system that you operate from the outside. With this vehicle, the intention is to be able to operate the system from the inside of the vehicle. Considering the new truck concept is called the Africa truck, there exists the potential to market the conceptual and modular design to other African countries or even international clientele. I asked Smith whether there are plans to broaden the market for the Africa truck in the future. In future, yes, but I think it's a bit premature. What's going to happen now is this is a demonstrator. We call it a demonstrator again to demonstrate the technology still exists in designing and building such trucks. This demonstrator truck, which was built by the NEL, will now be handed over to Armscore and the CSIR and they will start conducting reliability and mobility testing of the vehicle, mainly at the test track, Eurotech test track. And after that, once those tests are completed, we will finalize the configuration of the truck and decide then what the final configuration would be and also the decision on a fleet of these vehicles will then be taken. So a bit premature but surely that's why we call it the Africa truck. The intention is in future to market in Africa but that will be in a while. The truck as you can see it's huge. In Africa that's what you need, a lot of payload. So this truck gross vehicle mass is 28 tons. It has a payload capacity of 14 tons which is huge. So the capability of the truck off-road, it's a huge truck. It's not designed to be fast but it's designed to carry payload capacity of up to 14 ton. The truck as you see it here is a 6x6 version but uh, as I've said modular we can take different containers but the NEL also has the capability of producing this truck in a 4x4 or an 8x8 capacity as well. Also making an appearance at this is Africa Aerospace and Defence was aerospace components manufacturer AAT Composites which showcased its ability to meet strict international aircraft original equipment manufacturing protocols, thereby developing a range of internal and external components for aircraft. AAT Composites Innovation and Portfolio Senior Manager Dr. Louis Trudeau explains that the company undertook several work packages for aircraft manufacturer Pilatus earlier this year. In February 2016 this year, we uh, uh, obtained a new customer in, in the form of Pilatus aircraft, which is a well-known OEM from Europe. Um, especially its PC-12 aircraft fly are, yeah, are very prevalent in South Africa and also further up in Africa. Um, our uh, part for that would be four different work packages, uh, which include uh, various composite parts, varying from uh, interior components, some of them quite large, about four and a half meters long, and uh, um, up to uh, also exterior panels. Uh, so it's in total about uh, 80 different uh, part numbers that we will be su supplying. AAT Composites, uh, that, uh, that states um, Aerodyne, uh, started in the aircraft interiors market uh, already in 1992. The first project then was uh, for British Airways uh, for uh, carbon fiber backrest for the British Airways Concorde fleet. Um, then in the late 1990s, around 1998, uh, we uh, obtained other customers, um, also for mainstream airlines, uh, where we produced economic class backrests. 
uh, with numbers ranging up to where we produced a thousand batteries a week and uh, gradually that also grew into business class and uh, we are still busy with that today uh, where we have uh, three different projects running at the moment for various business class and economy class projects and uh, then also uh, other programs with, for aircraft interiors. Tredu also explains some of the latest trends in the aircraft components manufacturing sector at the moment. Composites uh, is interesting uh, material. It has a uh, yeah, good um, low weight with uh, high strength and stiffness properties. But the challenge there is, is, is cost. And uh, in order to compete with uh, traditional materials, you have to be clever in how you apply these materials in, the, in your process. Uh, in your process. Um, composite materials for background is also a bit different because you, you um, implant your material properties while you process it, which is a bit different from metals where the base metal, or uh, not the base metal, but the alloy that you're using already has the material properties greatly defined. And uh, so it means uh, being innovative in how you process them to have uh, uh, low, lower and lower uh, energy inputs and uh, quicker uh, cycle times and uh, so we are also researching these different methods and I've also implemented a new thermoplastic press which have uh, has around uh, five, five to ten minute, minute cycle times and um, yeah so that, that, that's, uh, that's what we are doing with that. Other news making headlines this week South African hazardous waste landfill sites have a new best practice champion in the multinational waste management company Averdas 250 million rand Plugfontein high hazardous class landfill sites in the Baal Triangle. David Oliveira has the story. Averda MD Johan van den Berg told media during a site visit that Plugfontein is the first landfill site of its kind in South Africa to comply with the new waste classification and management regulations which came into effect in August 2013. Flakfontein is a unique site because first and foremost it's the, it's the first landfill site that's been developed in this area in 20 years. It's built to the latest standards, not only surpassing local standards, leading towards an international standard to really service those global international customers that seeks more. It is also the first landfill site to be constructed to the standards prescribed by the waste classification and management regulations for Class A containment barriers and the first high hazard landfill site to be developed locally in 20 years. If you look in terms of our design, um, we've got a lot more stability in the design which prior landfill sites would have had. Um, if one has a look at the leachate control, we've now avoided a situation where we've got leachate contamination with water runoff and rainwater. We managed to separate the two where we can reuse a lot of the the natural sort of sources we're getting for dust suppression and for compaction and you know if I have a look at the the liners I mean this is a, this is a new sort of design and, and, and license requirement for South Africa and as we've discussed today if you go and have a look at the various seven layers that we've had to put in here and uh, I don't think there's a landfill site in South Africa that will that will that will even come close to this at the moment. The barrier or liner comprises a 1.2 meter deep multi-layered solution of compacted clay high density polyethylene, stone and geotextiles. The solution is designed to not only prevent harmful waste seeping into the soil, but also drain and capture environmentally harmful liquids, known as leachate. Leachate from Flakfontein's 500 meter cubed cell one site, which started accepting waste in May this year, is gravity fed into two 5,000 liter tanks. Once the tanks reach capacity, the leachate is pumped up to the leachate dam. Flakfontein will have six cells providing 6,500,000 cubic meters of landfill capacity. The cells will be constructed in a phased approach according to the rate at which preceding cells are filled. The site has a 30-year lifespan. The waste that Fouquet is currently or can be accepted at Flakfontein uh, runs from the from inert material or the least hazardous material to the highest possible risk associated with landfilling, which is type 1 waste. So Flakfontein can currently accept the most hazardous material at site, provided it meets legislative requirements. The process of waste acceptance involves classification of waste, waste assessment, and actually preparation of the safety data sheets for the waste. Um, we had to avert understand that such processes do not really fall within the core, core processes of the waste generators, so we offer that service to 
to waste generators and we classify and assess and prepare the SDSs on behalf of the plants. We make, we make use of an external accredited laboratory for your baseline analysis and we have an on-site laboratory verification lab to actually verify the parameters established during your baseline um, assessment. And um, from the time the truck arrives to the point of disposal, the, the procedure is actually very strict and as required by legislation, we um, ensure that all waste is accompanied by um, waste manifest documents. It's verified through our laboratory verification process and then uh, scattered on site for safe disposal. And once the waste is disposed, uh, the paper trail is tied up by the provision of a safe disposal certificate. That's Creamer Media's Real Economy Reports. Join us again next week for more news and insights into South Africa's real economy.